morning. Um, I know we are discussing uh, us all being in the middle of a transition, uh, charting a new course, and inclusiveness is key to not only surviving that transition, but actually thriving in it. Il y a un manque de travailleurs francophones et donc euh, il faut développer euh, une communauté francophone. Le manque de main en deux conduit à une situation critique. La migration a également entraîné une perte euh, de talent dans certains pays. The fact of the matter is, we used to speak about um, a number of, we used to speak about too many people chasing too few jobs. Uh, in the current uh, global climate, we have a number of labor market shortages in key industries in the industrialized West, and we have too many jobs chasing too few people. And so uh, in that environment, how will the economy benefit from this workforce? How will um, the skills of newcomers coming to Canada uh, be truly harnessed to grow our economy? and create a more prosperous society? Uh, and how will we uh, work on competencies uh, and a common base knowledge to acquire uh, the skills necessary for the, for the green economy, the clean economy, the more inclusive economy? And digitization will, of course, raise new boundaries between communities. It, will, uh, it is important for all of us to make sure that we evaluate the impact that digitization uh, is having and will continue to have on immigrant and other marginalized communities. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, for example, in this current environment, who can work from home and who cannot work from home? Uh, how do we enable as many people as possible to have the skills that they need, but also how do we need to build the systems that can integrate the people that, uh, that obtain those skills? And how are we ensuring that uh, 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 workers who have uh, worked on a number of uh, for, for a number of years in a particular industry can transition uh, and, and obtain the skills necessary to transition to 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 the future economy. And in all of this, I think employers have to become even more nimble. They have to become more inclusive. They have to become more sensitive to the need to uh, bring in uh, people. Uh, who have different perspectives and different backgrounds, because really that is not only good for, uh, for, for society, but it's actually also good for the bottom line. So as we uh, build a more inclusive economy uh, and transition to, uh, to that economy, we have to ask ourselves not just about the tools that we need to equip uh, workers with and the skills that they need to thrive in that new economy, but what systems are we building and how are we building them to make them uh, not only more uh, diverse to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the different backgrounds and the experiences of people, but also um, uh, the, the inclusivity piece is key to all of that. So uh, I, uh, I thank you for, uh, for allowing me to uh, make that, that, those introductory remarks. But I, but I, I, I will say that, uh, uh, you know, the fact that uh, Canada is a diverse society is a fact. We all see that. But inclusion is a choice, and we have to make the choice for inclusion every single day, not just in our society, but also in our economy and in how we embrace uh, the, the, the new economy and the possibilities for growth that come with that. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Bonjour tout le monde. Mon nom est Pierre Ouellet. Je suis le, le recteur de l'Université de l'Ontario français. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pierre Ouellet. I'm the president of uh, Université de l'Ontario français. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, Please bear with me. Um, I think that things are going well, but uh, as a as a, Fra a bilingual francophone, I'll often say that I, I I might have a kind of like a bad hair day, but a bad English day. So this could be a bad English day for me. You never know before you start, but um, I think that uh, things are going well, and I'm. Um, I, I think the translation is working. We had a uh, just a few questions before starting. Um, I'll just maybe uh, thank. The, the Toronto Global Forum for assembling this, uh, this panel. Uh, what a great panel to speak about this very, very important issue. Um, and as uh, was said during the introduction uh, today, we're, we're talking about the importance of global talents and immigration in the workplace. Um, et je pense que vous conviendrez avec moi 
qui a probablement pas beaucoup de questions plus importantes. Bien sûr, puis je sais qu'on est dans un forum économique aujourd'hui. Euh, on parle beaucoup d'économie. Uh, but this is also a very, very important topic for the social fabric of this country and the social fabric of francophones throughout this country as well. Uh, so thank you for being here today. Um, I'll just maybe mention a few words about UOF, about l'Université de l'Ontario Francais, before I get started. Um, UOF is the, uh, the newest university in Ontario. It was created after decades um, of work by the Franco-Ontarian community asking for a university in Toronto, a French language university in Toronto. And we're very proud uh, that we, we actually were able to launch uh, during a global pandemic last year. Um, so, it, because I, I can't stress this enough, the, the Francophone community in this area is 40% of the largest francophone community outside of Quebec. So there's, there are over 700,000 francophones in Ontario. 40% of those francophones live in this area where there was no French university before. So this is going to contribute in a huge manner to, to creating leaders uh, for the francophone community for the next decades. So we're very proud of, uh, of course, of launching last year and the work that we are doing. Um, so, without uh, waiting, uh, without uh, waiting, I, I would like to introduce um, our uh, panelists for this morning's uh, discussion. To my left, Perrin Beatty. Perrin Beatty is President and Chief Executive Officer. Of course, I don't need to, to introduce Perrin Beatty, but mm -hmm. uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Navdi Baines is Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking at CIBC. Marcia Akbar is Research Lead on lab Labour Immigration at the, the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at Toronto Metropolitan University. Et uh, finalement, et, et non pas le moindre, uh, Yves Gérard Méouloko, Commissaire en Équité et Droits de la Personne au Conseil des Écoles Publiques de l'Est de l'Ontario. Et également, depuis peu, depuis quelques mois, vice-président Fédération des communautés francophones et acadiennes du Canada. Donc, merci beaucoup d'être là aujourd'hui à nos quatre invités. So, I will start with, uh, of course, with the first question. Um, and that question is, how can a multilingual and diverse global workforce benefit the economy? Perrin, I'd, I'd like to... Well, I guess the starting point is, we have no choice. We need to, first of all, encourage immigration from around the world. Some 75% of the growth that takes place in Canada's population comes from immigration. Without that, we would actually have a shrinking workforce. There are a million jobs going begging in Canada today. And so we need to invite people from around the world to be able to come here. But it goes beyond that. The fact is this is probably the single most important competitive advantage that Canada has when you look at international business. Increasingly, Canadian businesses are looking to the world as their market, as their supplier as well. And what they need to do is to be able to reach out and to build bridges that enable them to communicate with people around the, around the world, both, both uh, linguistically and culturally as well. So this is an enormous advantage. As other, uh, the great contest, I believe, in the world today is not between left and right, but between open and closed societies. And as we increasingly see other societies closing their doors, turning inwards, seeing the rest of the world as a threat, one of the things that makes Canada unique is the fact that our population is open to the world, that we see immigration as a net plus, and that we recognize that diversity enriches, enriches all of us. This gives us an opportunity at a time when we desperately need skills in Canada to attract literally the best and the brightest in the world to come to our country to help us build it. And that's an opportunity we just can't afford to miss. Yeah, absolutely, a million jobs, that's a huge number. Yeah, no, I think um, as well said, Baron, and I, I, I agree, uh, you know, if you look at uh, even some of the major financial institutions, banks and pension funds, they truly want to expand in other markets and it's great to leverage the diversity we have here so we take advantage of as as as, as was described as our competitive advantage um, and so i think that's very important as well but for me 
having a diverse workforce, a multilingual workforce, goes beyond simply just celebrating our diversity. It's what the minister said before. It's about being deliberate with inclusion and why that's important. When you include people of diverse backgrounds and of diverse perspectives in the decision-making process, you avoid groupthink. Uh, you innovate. You come up with new ideas, new solutions. And when I was a minister of innovation, science, and industry for a number of years, I took it upon myself to build a strong tech ecosystem in Canada. And the secret sauce for that was people. Uh, and immigration has been highlighted as an example because when you bring in top-tier global talent, comes with that a lot of capital uh, because they are investing in people and their ideas. And so I think you know we have diversity, but we got to be thoughtful and deliberate about inclusion. And when we do that, we generate innovative solutions and ideas, and that allows us to compete, that allows us to deal with issues around productivity, that enables us to scale and grow companies. And so there's enormous economic opportunities. Uh, and then, of course, a sense of belonging, right? Uh, when people contribute, they do well economically, they have a greater sense of belonging as well. Absolutely. In French, we say le vivre ensemble. Le vivre Absolument, together. oui. Oui, oui. d'accord. Oui. Aushia? Definitely, um, a diverse and multicultural, multilingual workforce will benefit economy, particularly Canadian economy. And it is already happening now. In Canada, the 100% growth in the labor force is happening through migration. The 100% growth in the post-secondary institution is happening through international students. They pay tuition fees, they work, they pay tax. So they are contributing to the economy. So to understand the contributions in a better way, I would like to reverse the question. How do or how will economy benefit the migrant workers? We also need to ask whether the migrant labor force is getting proper healthcare and social services. Are they treated with respect and dignity at the workplace? Are their skills and educational qualifications match what they do? Um, these questions are important to address to understand the relationship between economic benefit and labor force. Because in Canada, we also see de-skilling and skill waste sometimes. Uh, for my research, I do uh, talk to international students and recent graduates. And sometimes they, I see that graduates who are uh, getting MA or bachelor degree in economics, engineering, finance, and not, in, not getting a job in their field. Uh, so they are working in the very um, low paid sector in the service industry. So to make sure that uh, the multicultural uh, and diverse labor force is benefiting the economy, we need to make sure that they are also um, getting the services and support they need and specifically to make sure that the skills are not wasted. Hmm. Thank you, Marcia. Yves Gérard, j'aimerais t'entendre aussi sur la même question. Donc, comment une main d'œuvre, puis en particulier en parlant de, de ton expérience au pays, de ton expérience de travail aussi mm -hmm. des dernières années, donc comment une main d'œuvre mondiale multilingue et diversifiée contribue-t-elle à l'économie? En fait, elle est aujourd'hui la source de la croissance de l'économie canadienne. Et je crois que c'est une, euh, ce serait un euphémisme de nier cela. Euh, la croissance de l'économie canadienne aujourd'hui passe par cette immigration qui est plurielle, qui parle plusieurs langues, qui a une culture extrêmement diversifiée et qui bénéficie à un pays qui est manifestement très ouvert sur le monde, qui est en pleine construction encore, en pleine construction identitaire qui plus est, et qui amène un niveau de complexité aussi dans tout ça. Euh, Aujourd'hui, il est important de comprendre que la question linguistique au Canada, on le sait, c'est un enjeu, c'est notre sport national après le hockey, la question linguistique, parce qu'on aime bien s'entre-déchirer malheureusement un petit peu là-dessus, mais aujourd'hui, il va être très important de comprendre que ces nouveaux venus, ces nouveaux immigrants, le ministre tout à l'heure parlait de la nécessité justement d'un apport en immigration francophone qui plus est, euh, qui est absolument nécessaire pour la survie sociale du pays dans son ensemble. Donc, la question de l'immigration ne passe pas seulement par la, le bénéfice pour 
l'économie, mais passe également pour le bénéfice et la croissance sociale du Canada. On va avoir un pays qui ne croit aujourd'hui qu'à part parce qu'on ne fait pas d'enfants au Canada. C'est notre réalité. Hein? Euh, donc, on a besoin définitivement de cet apport qui vient de l'extérieur. Mais la grande question qui se pose, et je pense que ma collègue l'a bien dit, c'est est « Sommes-nous prêts aujourd'hui ?» à inclure véritablement ces nouveaux venus. L'intégration est une chose, c'est ce qu'on réclame aux nouveaux arrivants, mais l'inclusion en est une autre. Sommes-nous prêts Formons-nous leurs collègues de travail pour les accueillir et pour leur permettre justement de pouvoir s'épanouir dans leur environnement de travail. Et là encore, j'ai des doutes à ce sujet-là. Là-dessus, on a encore beaucoup de travail à faire, mais somme toute, l'économie et l'apport de, de, de l'immigration est crucial aujourd'hui pour la croissance économique, sociale du pays et pour la cohésion sociale dont nous avons besoin. Donc, c'est vraiment une, un élément clé. Merci, Gérard. On, on, ta voix d'animateur de radio nous fait un peu tous gêner sur, sur l'estrade. Euh, je suis particulièrement... J'ai beaucoup aimé ta réponse, bien sûr, mais je pense que les, les communautés francophones de partout au pays, sont très préoccupés par les dernières données du recensement. Donc, ça va être très intéressant, je pense. Et je pense que, que Catherine Cano, peut-être en, fin euh, en fin de panel aujourd'hui, va nous en parler euh, et parler des actions concrètes qu'on doit poser. Mais moi, comme franco-ontarien, je suis particulièrement préoccupé par les dernières données du recensement. Et je pense qu'il touche à la réponse si, que tu nous donnais tantôt. Oui, si vous me permettez, je vais ajouter ceci. Vous avez raison d'être préoccupé. Aujourd'hui, ce qui se passe euh, au Canada pour les francophones, partout, partout au pays, c'est qu'on assiste à un recul démographique des francophones. Un recul démographique est causé par quoi Par une absence d'immigration, par le fait que l'immigration, certes, est croissante au pays, mais l'immigration francophone ne croit pas à la même vitesse que la totalité de l'immigration. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, je sais qu'à la FCFA, nous avons réclamé par exemple une cible de 4,4% et voire même plus. On demande aujourd'hui une cible de réparation pour nous permettre essentiellement de retrouver les niveaux que nous avions dans le passé. Parce que Prenons l'exemple de l'Ontario, où nous représentions à peu près 6,4% de la population il y a quelques années. Aujourd'hui, les francophones représentent à peu près 4% de la population. Et c'est crucial. Et c'est aujourd'hui l'avenir de ces communautés-là. Donc, l'avenir d'une partie de l'identité canadienne est cruellement menacé par un déficit d'immigration qui nuit à l'innovation francophone au pays, qui nuit à la vitalité de ces communautés et qui nuit à l'épanouissement, finalement, d'une communauté et donc d'une partie de l'identité. Tout, tout à fait, tout à fait. Merci pour cet ajout. Navdeep, I'll go with you for this, uh, for, the, for our second question. To start uh, answering our second question, of course, I think everyone recognizes that we're not today in 2022, we're not in the same, we're not living in the same world that we lived before 2020, um, uh, before the pandemic, of course. And I heard someone this morning talking about the next pandemic. I think it's just a matter of statistics. There will be a next pandemic. We just don't know when it's going to happen. So. What is the impact of digitization and remote work on the immigrant workforce? Uh, it's a great question. And um, just on the previous point, I would say that the services in French, c'est très important. Et dans ma circonscription à Mississauga, uh, il n'y a pas beaucoup de gens qui parlent français. But what I did was, as minister responsible for Statistics Canada, we posed a bunch of questions that would get better outcomes for French-speaking Canadians in services outside of Quebec, in particular, and obviously English-speaking in Quebec. Um, and, and I think that's important to note, that when we do talk about immigration, we got to have the infrastructure in place, as we discussed. With regards to your question, um, in terms of the next pandemic and what this means for the immigrant population or newcomers, I, I see it firsthand. Uh, I live in Mississauga, and uh, I'm very close to the airport. So when people arrive to Canada, proximity matters. So they go down the road and they kind of find the first, you know, is this unit for rent? <laughs> then we'll move in. And when they move in, it's usually you live with your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles. So it's multi-generational, multiple families. And in the pandemic, uh, if you are working from home, you kind of need a quiet spot. It's difficult to do when you go in the basement and it's finished and there's someone living there because it's rented out. You go upstairs and there's a few people in the room, uh, you know, uh, and like I said, a bunch of people crowded in, in the space. So that was a real challenge. Uh, newcomers don't have access to the technologies. Uh, we noticed very quickly 
you know, if if they wanted, uh, you know, the, the latest phone or laptops or even some of the basics that we take for granted sometimes, uh, assuming that everyone has that, newcomers struggle with that technology or access to that technology. And some of the work that they do, it's not conducive to doing it um, uh, online. And you notice during the pandemic, high rates of um, deaths took place in the region of Peel because of the labor market and the labor workforce, which was geared towards distribution centers and they had to go and work and they didn't have the luxury of working from home. There wasn't enough white you know, collar jobs. There was a lot of blue collar jobs. And so I think you know, that inequity that exists in the labor market that disproportionately impacts newcomers is something we need to be mindful of. So I believe we need to create strategies that speak to those conditions, uh, that understand the unique challenges that newcomers face and prepare them better for that next eventual pandemic. And we don't know when that will happen. We don't know how that will unfold. We wanna make sure though that people that are already struggling aren't further left behind. Absolutely. Marcia? Yes, I totally agree with what Navdeep already mentioned um, in terms of all the challenges that migrants face um, when they want to work uh, th uh, through virtual platform um, or remote, do remote work. So I would like to add that uh, migrants are already isolated in Canada, especially when they come new, like the newcomers. Uh, they don't have social networks and professional networks. So working from home uh, would not create that opportunity for them to meet people and to create that social network. I would also like to focus on the gender aspect of remote working because as we know, during the pandemic, uh, the workload of women actually increased because they were responsible for household work, child care, elderly care, as well as working uh, from, from home. Uh, so that didn't create uh, a healthy work-life balance for women. So we need to consider all these aspects to kind of assess and evaluate that how remote working would affect international uh, migrants or newcomers. Uh, we also need to uh, think about who can and cannot work from home. Uh, eventually, during the pandemic, uh, there was a division uh, in the society in terms of their uh, profession and career. So some people can work from home, they have that luxury, but some can, for example, essential workers. So we, we saw that division in the society as well. So definitely the pandemic actually uh, shed light on a number of issues in terms of our uh, workplace, work culture, as well as in terms of our society and social division. And we need to address those strategically um, to prepare ourselves for the next pandemic, although I hope that there won't be any <laughs> in the near future. Thanks, Marcia. Yves Gérard, veux-tu veux poursuivre dans... Qu'est-ce qu -ce que la, le travail virtuel, qu'est-ce que ça change pour les travailleurs immigrants? C'est énorme comme changement. Je pense que Marcia a amené des points très importants sur la question, justement, euh, du fait que plusieurs de nos travailleurs immigrants euh, ne peuvent pas travailler, malheureusement, à domicile parce qu'ils n'ont pas les emplois qui leur permettent. Mais la réalité est la suivante. Les immigrants, aujourd'hui, les nouveaux arrivants, bien, ne travaillent pour la plupart que je crois que c'est 50% d'entre eux qui travaillent dans des métiers, qui réussissent à avoir des emplois qui correspondent à leur formation réelle. Et on sait qu'aujourd'hui, la capacité d'inclusion de ces gens sur le marché du travail passe par deux éléments qui sont fondamentaux. Tout d'abord, le savoir-faire, donc leurs compétences, donc leur formation initiale. Et là, encore une fois, je répète cette statistique, 50% d'entre eux seulement vont travailler dans des métiers qui ont un réel apport à leur formation. Par la suite, il y a le savoir-être. Donc, la question maintenant de la compréhension des codes canadiens sur le marché du travail. On le sait, nous sommes une société où l'interpersonnel compte énormément. La question des promotions au mérite n'existe plus ou moins. Hein? Ça dépend surtout aussi de qui tu connais, de qui tu es également. Alors, cet aspect des choses 
se développe de quelle façon en étant en contact avec nos collègues de travail. Malheureusement, le virtuel ne nous permet pas ce contact-là. Donc, la personne qui est arrivée au Canada en 2020, comme ce monsieur hier que j'ai vu à l'aéroport quand je suis arrivé avec toute sa famille et toutes les, tous les bagages qui arrivent au Canada pour la première fois et qui, pauvre lui, a déjà perdu sa valise, ça commence très bien. Mais euh, la réalité est la suivante, c'est bien comment finalement s'inclure sur le marché du travail Comment vais-je pouvoir développer cette compétence du savoir-être canadien, donc de développer ses codes Hein, de communication, de relations interpersonnelles, si je ne suis pas en contact avec mes collègues de travail. Et ça, ça devient un enjeu qui est fondamental. Donc oui, c'est pratique, parce qu'aujourd'hui, ça nous a permis de démocratiser en quelque sorte le travail, ça nous permet de pouvoir continuer à travailler à partir de notre, du confort de notre domicile, mais pour les nouveaux arrivants, c'est un enjeu énorme en termes d'inclusion sur le marché du travail, parce que là, encore une fois, comme Marshall le disait, ils vont se retrouver isolés, même si en plus, plusieurs d'entre eux se retrouvent à faire des métiers qui ne correspondent pas du tout à leur formation initiale. C'est très intéressant quand on repense à ce que le ministre Hussein nous disait tantôt, c'est-à-dire que la diversité est un fait, l'inclusion est un choix. Exactement. Et tu viens de nous parler de plusieurs facteurs qui sont de l'ordre de l'inclusion <rire> et non pas de la diversité. Exactly. Perrin, what does it change for, for, for Canadian businesses uh, to have migrant workers, immigrant, the immigrant workforce working remotely or being called upon to work remotely? Does it change anything for Canadian businesses? It sure does. Over the course of the pandemic, I perhaps had more conversations with CEOs than at any other comparable period. And I've yet to find one who said that his or her company was going to look the same post-pandemic as it did before. Same for other institutions as well. Everybody's had to rethink their structure, their business plan, how they serve their, their, their clients and their employees. Um, there are pluses and minuses here. Um, the first, from the perspective of, uh, of an immigrant coming to Canada, NAV, one of, the, one of the good points may very well be that because of the distributed w workforce, not everybody will have to live in your old constituency. That's right, that's right. It means that in Atlantic Canada, where, where the issue of immigration has been such a struggle in the past, that's right. that they may be able to bring people in there, have them working in uh, businesses located in Toronto, but from Cape Breton or from some other, uh, some other community. That's a plus and, and, and that's good. What worries me, uh, though more than anything else, is whether you are a new Canadian or not, We've seen a large number of people coming into the workforce, coming into jobs and specific companies over the course of the pandemic. And there is a very real distinction between those people who were there all the time and who had pre-existing relationships, who knew their colleagues, who understood the culture of the organization, and those who've come in since. And one of the concerns that I have is that if we are going to get full productivity and success in companies, you have to have a, a, a workforce that knows each other, that collaborates with one another in a way that you can't do over Zoom if you don't know, uh, if you don't know your colleague. As it is, immigrants coming into Canada face a serious disadvantage. They're paid less, they're less uh, likely to be able to use to employ the skills that they brought to Canada for which they were recruited to come to this country. You add to that then the problem that they may be coming in and not being in a, work, in a workplace where they get to know their colleagues and where they develop those relationships and where you have the, the collegiality. And it may very well mean that we are putting a, uh, putting a burden on immigrants coming into the workforce and that we're losing the skill potential that they have and simply leaving this, this human potential on the table unused. Absolutely. Thanks, Bernd. Euh, pour la prochaine question, Yves Gérard, je vais commencer avec toi. Et c'est une question qui est, qui est particulièrement, qui, qui est importante pour moi, pour nous à l'Université de l'Ontario français. Puis j'imagine, bien sûr, pour tout, tout le secteur postsecondaire un peu partout au pays, quelles devraient être les priorités en matière d'éducation et de requalification qui sont essentielles pour l'avenir du travail et qui touchent particulièrement les travailleurs migrants? Euh, la question va de soi parce qu'elle est intimement liée à toute cette volonté d'inclure ces travailleurs migrants dans notre marché du travail. La clé, justement, comme le ministre l'a dit, c'est l'inclusion. Donc, dans le secteur de l'éducation, comment faciliter cette inclusion? 
Comment travailler sur le fait que les travailleurs, ces nouveaux arrivants, qui viennent enrichir en termes d'innovation, en termes de compétences, notre marché du travail, comment leur permettre et les outiller d'être compétents sur la base, justement, des, des compétences canadiennes qu'on souhaite qu'on souhaite qu'ils aient. Ce qui veut dire compétences interpersonnelles, communication interpersonnelle, développement de relations du vivre ensemble dans le secteur universitaire et dans le secteur dans l'ensemble du marché du travail. Ça, c'est un secteur qui est clé maintenant dans ce qu'on doit développer au niveau de l'éducation postsecondaire et même au niveau collégial aussi, pour leur permettre d'intégrer plus facilement le marché du travail et pour permettre qu'ils puissent utiliser efficacement leur qualification. Vous savez, très souvent, on demande à l'immigrant de s'intégrer, mais on ne l'inclut pas. L'inclure, justement, passerait par développer des, des programmes qui leur permettraient, justement, de pouvoir s'inclure plus facilement, être plus facilement inclus dans le marché du travail canadien le plus rapidement possible. Ça veut dire s'assurer que leurs compétences soient interprétées et mises à niveau au niveau canadien pour qu'ils puissent être fonctionnels. Un ingénieur qui arrive au Canada n'a pas besoin de conduire un taxi. On connaît tous cette histoire-là. Il a tout simplement besoin de comprendre les façons de faire canadiennes et pour, pu, pour qu'il puisse s'intégrer le plus rapidement possible au marché du travail. Et malheureusement, c'est là qu'on a un manque et c'est à ce niveau-là que la question de l'innovation au niveau de l'éducation post-secondaire et collégiale va être extrêmement important dans les prochaines années pour leur permettre le plus rapidement possible de se de s'intégrer au marché du travail, mais aussi de le faire à des coûts qui sont aussi qui sont aussi appropriés. On parle de gens qui arrivent au pays, donc c'est là que ça va être important aussi, qui est une conversation avec les élus, avec les gouvernants, pour que bien quelque chose soit fait pour permettre à ces nouveaux migrants bien de pouvoir avoir des formations d'appoint au niveau, en termes de compétences canadiennes, pour entrer le plus rapidement possible sur le marché du travail. Oui, tout à fait. Puis, je, peut-être un petit mot encourageant pour moi. J'ai, j'ai œuvré dans deux universités différentes. J'ai vu aussi, je collabore beaucoup avec mes, mes collègues des collèges, euh, en particulier en Ontario. Puis, je trouve que ce que tu, ce que tu mentionnes, l'approche par compétence, le savoir-faire, le savoir, les savoir-faire, les savoir-être, oui. pas seulement les connaissances, et beaucoup la direction que les collèges et les universités prennent de plus en plus. Puis je oui. pense que ça peut contribuer de façon très positive Absolument. À, à ce que tu, tu viens d'expliquer. Marsh, I, I will ask you the same uh, question. What should be the priorities for education and reskilling uh, for the future of work? Okay, so I use the word reskilling with a lot of caution because there are several meanings of reskilling. For example, when migrants come with foreign credentials for uh, their educational qualifications from foreign universities, there is an idea among the employers that that education is not as valid as Canadian education. So the understanding of reskilling in this context is that they have to gain some kind of Canadian education, Canadian experience. And also there are, for example, international students who graduate from Canadian uh, organized Canadian institutions and get training from different Canadian organizations. They also face uh, different difficulties in terms of getting a job again uh, for re- like for the issue of reskilling. And in this case, The reskilling is used in terms of cultural competency, understanding Canadian workplace, and so on. So, in my view, we should not look at reskilling as a way of actually excluding migrants, whether they have foreign education or Canadian education. We should use reskilling to actually give them, as my previous speaker mentioned, short training programs. can be organized by the employers or even by the government so that they can understand very quickly the work culture in in, in, in Canadian workplace. Also learn uh, different technological programs. Like when I talk to engineers, they say that they need to learn new softwares that they they are not familiar with um, in their back home. So we need 
programs, efficient programs, effective programs that would allow migrant workers to learn the workplace culture and the required job skills because they are talented, they are intelligent. Uh, Canada picks up the best, best and the brightest from the world uh, through the migration process. We should not have any doubt about their talent and skills. Uh, but anyone, not only migrants, all of you, all of us need some kind of training when we start a new job. So that kind of reskilling actually the migrant workers need. We don't uh, want to fall into the trap of de-skilling and reskilling. So we need to go forward through reskilling. So Perrin, how, how do Canadian businesses see that? If uh, Marcia was saying, you know, there might be more of a burden on businesses to, to, to reskill or to train or to, is are, are, are businesses ready for that? Are they doing it already? Um, it, it's changing. In the, in the past, there used to be an assumption on the part of business that it was your job as an educator to produce a somebody to exactly the uh, specifications that we wanted and we would receive them and bring them into the business. Increasingly, there's a recognition that, that business has to invest itself, first of all, in its own workforce and constantly upgrading skills that are there. Secondly, also in terms of uh, helping ensure that the people that they're bringing in have the precise skills that, that they need. What, what we desperately need in, in Canada is to intensify the dialogue among educators, business and government. We need to do a much better job than historically we've done in terms of predicting what the skills needs are going to be in the future. Uh, again, there used to be the assumption that, that we can more or less order that we you know, produce for us X number of engineers in such and such an area. Anybody who knows anything about post-secondary education knows that it takes years to put in place programs and to bring on the stream of people. It's not turning a tap on and off. And that's why we need to, to have a much better dialogue, one that's much more intense and one that, that uh, is much more precise in terms of identifying um, opportunities for us for, for the future. Um, one other comment I would make just with regard to international students, because I'm really glad you raised that. I used to be chancellor at uh, Ontario's second youngest institution, <laughs> which was the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, Ontario Tech U. And I would sit there at, at uh, convocation and look out at the, at the crowd. And I remember thinking at, at the morning convocation, if these graduate, if these international students could pass a security test at lunchtime by two, I would offer them a work permit yeah. to stay in Canada. Mm -hmm. What we're looking for in Canada is people trained to Canadian standards who speak English or French, who uh, have some understanding of our culture and of our, our market here. That's the definition of an international student. And we need to do a much better job of, of uh, uh, attracting them to stay in Canada. One of the most innovative things I've seen was Brock University uh, some years ago in the local Chamber of Commerce. Uh, each year would, would have a reception for graduating international students. And the local business community would be there, invite them, and they could allow the students to kick the tires and see what sort of job opportunities there might be locally, but would also mean that employers would be aware of, hey, this is somebody here who has, seems to have some real skills and potential. How can we uh, create an opportunity for them? The cost of that is the cost of a beer. Yeah. Um, and so we don't have to wait on government. There are things that we can do together to try to address this now. Absolutely. Um, a shameless plug, we have uh, Université de l'Ontario Française uh, uh, working on what we call a carrefour de l'innovation et du savoir, which, which is a connection between students, students will graduate from UF eventually, and of course, the, the many partners that we have in the workplace in the community. Great. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, uh, just yeah. to pick up on the point that Barron's made and even the earlier comment around one million vacancies that exist in Canada. What's so unique about the challenging economic times we see now with all the pressure on growth going down and, and recession being bantered about that word um, and the markets being so volatile is that we have a tight labor market. Like it's so unusual to have a record low unemployment when things are difficult in terms of the macroeconomic conditions. And the, the real issue here is the mismatch that we've discussed, right? The, the, the jobs without people and people without jobs. And one particular success that, um, that we, when I was a minister, that we supported and that now that scaled up significantly is palette skills. It was started by Dr. Arvind Gupta at UFT. 
And what they essentially do is, you know, speaking to primarily uh, people in the hospitality sector, for example, or in the service sector, they went out to technology companies and said, what are your main challenges in scaling up? Mm-hmm. And usually they've got the solution, but they struggle with their marketing and sales teams. They, you know, these are people that are invent things, they're really cool at invention, they don't know how to start a business, so they bring someone in, but they desperately realize quickly that they need marketing and sales skills. And what they did is they worked with Pallet, and Pallet would go out to, say, the hospitality industry or the service industry in general and say to people, and these are pr- primarily newcomers, right, because the difficulty of, of the challenges with getting their skills accredited, would do this rapid micro-training session where the employer would say, we'll, we'll lend you a job if you can get these skill sets. And within the span of two to three months, you can imagine someone who's, say, in the hotel industry. They're very good at communicating with people. Now they're selling a technology and the person that they're selling the technology to isn't technically savvy. <laughs> they just want someone who can have that empathy, the communication skills, in layman terms, explain how the technology works. And this program was so successful in the sense that 90% of the people that went through the training landed jobs, and 30% of them got promoted within the first 18 months. And they quickly went up their organizations. And Desire to Learn is a great example of a technology company here in Kitchener, Waterloo that used the Palette Skills Initiative where they were able to attract a lot of talent because they were struggling. Um, and, and so the point being is, is that there are so many opportunities, it's a skills mismatch, and newcomers that are not reaching their potential for all the reasons we discussed, this is a great way to accelerate that and build on the micro-credentials we talked about and the reskilling we talked about uh, to enable them to find meaningful employment, but also to quickly rise up the ranks. Um, and contribute to our economy and earn higher wages and give back to the community. What an interesting uh, project. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, this, we have about five minutes left, so this will be our last question. And, um, and Marsha, I will go to you to, to answer this question first. What can we say now about gender equity? Okay, so gender equity or gender inequality is not an issue in Canada, it's a global issue. So in Canada, women earn 89 cents when men earn $1. And in 2021, last year, women employees earned 11% less than their male counterparts. According to the Canadian Women's Foundation, it will take 267.6 years to close the gender gap in the economy, in the world, worldwide economy. So we don't want to wait that long, do we? (laughs) I hope not. (laughs) We wanna see the change in our lifetime and we can start to make the changes from here within Canada. So there are lots of, employers, CS, CEOs, governors of the banks, and so on. So I'm going to request everybody to, when you recruit or hire employees, make sure that gender equity is within your uh, EDI policy, equity, inclusion, and diversity policy. So uh, this is what I want to say. I feel really strange, even at this point in 2021, still there is a gender pay gap. Mm -hmm. Still women are concentrated in very much feminized jobs, mostly healthcare and uh, education sector, which is not bad. Even in Canada, there's a huge concentration of female workers in the care sector and and, and education sector. But we need to think about the, which tire, which segment of, the job sector that women work. And if you uh, look at closely the data, you'll see that women are mostly concentrated in the precarious, uh, low-wage, low-skilled sectors, even when they have skills to do better jobs. So there's a systematic uh, gender equity in the Canadian labor market, I have to say that, and of course, uh, in the world in general. We need to address this and we need to make sure that uh, the gender equity is established through our hiring system, uh, through the way we treat women or or, uh, 
construct women and their roles in the society. We have to get out of the patriarchal gender roles and uh, appreciate women's talent and in intelligence and their work skills. Thanks, Marsha. Gentlemen, anyone want to? Yeah, I, I'll just to pick up on that. It starts at the top, in my humble opinion, as well. So uh, one initiative that I was very proud of that I started again just speaking to my former role as Minister of Innovation, Science, and Industry was this initiative called 5030. And the objective was to say that boards and senior management should have clear goals and strategies around getting gender parity at the board level and the management level. And the 30 represented BIPOC communities, right? So broader diversity as well. And this was to build on the disclosure requirements legislation that was passed to ask corporations say, you've got to have a diversity policy. Uh, comply or explain. If you don't have one, then you need to explain to your shareholders and your broader stakeholders why you don't have a diversity policy. So it was meant to create some peer pressure to say you got to move in this space. The, the, um, the data is overwhelming in terms of the economic benefits associated with greater representation of women and people of diverse backgrounds in these senior positions. So I think in organization, um, you know, we talked about newcomers struggling to fit into a culture. Imagine they come into a culture and they see this at the leadership level, the kind of tone it sets. And, and I think it's really important. And then on a personal level, I've got two daughters, so I've got a bit of a bias. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, you know, it starts at the top. The board and management can set the tone for the organization. Absolutely. I wonder whether I can just add to that, that this is uh, the whole conversation we've had this morning is a happy one and that it's a case where doing the right thing is also the smart thing to do. And just focusing on, on you know, why it is smart. We have to, have to have gender equity and to have openness and to, uh, to have genuine diversity. Uh, we're a rich country, but we're not so rich that we can afford to waste the skills of anybody who wants, us to, to, wants to help us build the society. And yet we're doing that today. And we're doing it with a majority group, women, yes. which, is, which is astonishing. It is striking to me to see how tenacious the cultural barriers are even when you put legal uh, measures in place. Again, going back to my days sitting at convocation, I would look down at the students graduating in the nursing programs and in the teaching programs, predominantly female. Mm -hmm. Then you get to the engineering programs or computer yeah. security, massively male. We have to, in 2022, break down those cultural barriers if we're going to get the full value out of the skills that we have in our society. Absolutely, thanks. Thanks, Baron. Um, I'll introduce our next, uh, our next speaker now. Yves Gérard, je suis désolé, on manque de, on manque de temps pour, <laughs> pour ta réponse à cette question-là, mais je, vais, je, vais vraiment, je voulais vraiment vous présenter Catherine Cano, qui va être notre prochaine, um, notre prochaine présentatrice uh, aujourd'hui. So I'll introduce Catherine Cano. Ka uh, Catherine is an innovative global leader and a, an accomplished top executive in a time of transformational change with a solid expertise in media, strategic management, governance, eth ethics, and financial stewardship. Madame Cano has been an executive manager for almost 20 years in media organizations as the head of news and 24-hour news networks at Radio-Canada, CBC, and deputy news director at Al Jazeera in Qatar and CEO of the media network CPAC. Son expérience s'étend de la gestion de la réputation, stratégie média, gestion de changement, diplomatie, négociation dans le contexte multilatéral et multiculturel, Et j'en passe. Catherine, je ne veux pas te voler plus de ton temps, donc euh, je te cède la parole. Merci, merci infiniment. On m'a demandé de faire la conclusion de ce panel. So, on behalf of uh, all of us, I want to thank the very distinguished and expert panel uh, for a very, very extraordinary, rich and thoughtful discussion of these crucial issues at a pivotal moment in our social, economic and political development. What emerges from uh, this discussion is that diversity and inclusiveness are key to our future su success and that societies that reject this idea do so at their peril. And I'd say, as Mr. Bitty said, we have no choice. The irony is that in a crisis, we must take the time to understand the underlying factors and to plan a rational and well-executed response. This is very challenging. On dit en français qu'on est à la croisée des chemins. Just um, to remind you, in the last 24 hours, 
We have seen a massive flood in, uh, and fires in Nigeria, in Pakistan, the Caribbean, and the southern United States. Climate change alone will drive hundreds of millions of people to flee from their own safety in the years to come. There's a huge migration movement. In fact, the UN is predicting that one billion people will be displaced before the end of this century. Wars and famine in Ukraine, Afghanistan and Africa and elsewhere are forcing entire populations to relocate. Meanwhile, aging populations in Western societies such as ours need immigrants to fill hundreds of thousands of critical jobs. Already factories, farms and restaurants, banks can't operate at full capacity because of the lack of qualified staff. Let's not mince our words. We are in a crisis. Lower production, disrupted supply chains and climate change are reducing the number of product products on shelves and pushing up prices. People are being forced to buy cheaper and less healthy products and make a choice between paying the rent or buying groceries. La pénurie de travailleurs francophones pose en elle-même un défi particulier pour les communautés francophones et pour le Québec qui tient fermement à son identité et à sa culture et à la survie de la langue française, mais tient aussi à son économie dynamique et croissante qui a besoin d'attirer les immigrants. C'est une réalité et c'est une préoccupation de toutes les communautés francophones du pays. Le recul démographique, comme le disait le professeur, des francophones est une réalité et il est crucial d'agir urgentement pour contrevenir à cette hémorragie. Juste hier, le gouvernement fédéral admettait d'ailleurs qu'il qu devait faire mieux et plus pour attirer les francophones au pays. Québec, Alberta et Saskatchewan are all pushing for more control over immigration to their provinces, understanding that this is crucial to their economic development. While overall Canada remains the world's most welcoming society for immigrants, attitudes are hardening in certain parts of the country. Some places are closing their arms, not opening them. I am sure that you and your organization have diversity, equity and inclusion policies and are already inclusive. But if so, you are among only 40% of Canadian companies to do so. And that's according to the uh, a study by the University of Queen's. I'm myself a daughter of an immigrant father who was born in Algeria um, before the, the independence. Um, and his, his parents were Spanish. And I, had a, I have still a deeply rooted Quebec Francophone mother. I've seen both sides of the equation from birth. And in my career, I've worked in the United States for more than a decade. I was deputy news director of the English language Al Jazeera News Services. I oversaw a global network of 3,500 uh, 3, journalists based in 70 countries from the headquarters in Doha. And I was also chief operating officer of l'Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie with 88 member countries. At the OIF, at the Francophonie, we had to eliminate a significant deficit and introduce a transparent and accountable new organizational culture. If our staff and managers are not included representation from what cross-section of member countries, including Senegal, Madagascar, um, Vietnam, France, um, the DRC, name it, all the countries were actually represented in our offices, our efforts would quite simply uh, they would have failed. This diverse group was able to uh, keep us alert to cultural differences and realities, and they brought context to um, the process of thinking of how we were going to solve our problem. And that diversity and those opinions and experiences kept our decision making on track, relevant and realistic. And we did solve the, the deficit within eight months. It was not a small one. So I, I thank them for being there with us to make this work. So this will not come to, um, to a surprise to those of you who follow corporate excellence. Businesses with diverse leadership consistently outperform those with top-down monolithic decision-making. 
As Francis uh, Fukuyama, who you probably know, pointed out in this week, Atlantic, the Atlantic, the same phenomenon applies to entire societies. We are in a moment of rising confrontation between liberal democracies and authoritarian societies where decision-making is increasingly in the hands of a very unpresentative and isolated few. The outcomes are potentially catastrophic, as we can see in the war in Ukraine and stalic economic growth in China. Immigration then is vital to our future here in Canada, and we are not doing nearly as, as well as we should. And I think the panel pointed out uh, all the things that uh, we need to actually work on. We are attracting, for instance, highly qualified people, but then we are wasting their talents, as Mrs. Akbar said. Uh, we are not providing the infrastructure and the tools to ensure the success as well as our own. We need to humanize these processes, not just because we have to bring people in, but because we want to and need their skills and their humanity too. We all agree inclusion is key. It is as important for new Canadians to understand the Canadian way, the Canadian way of life, as it is for employers to take advantage of what those workers bring to the table. The next step is making diversity standard practice and just plain normal. C'est une question de valeur et de bon sens, social et économique. The right thing to do is perfectly aligned with the economic and social success, and we need to do more. We need to do more to resolve the problem of integrating international credentials and experience. We need to do more to ensure that new Canadians are connected. Remote work creates an additional challenge here, as we said. We heard shocking uh, numbers regarding women. Overall, we are, women are still far from achieving their full economic potential here in Canada, from the front lines to the, bo the boardrooms. Our only growing domestic population, indigenous youth, are not sufficiently welcomed and integrated. We have to give everyone, and particularly new Canadians, the tools to succeed, including infrastructure such as affordable housing and schools. We have to find a way to make these investments because the return will be tenfold. There are some points of light and solutions were brought up, training, education, reskilling, um, working together. Uh, there's an example that Canada's, uh, that may inspire you. Uh, it's called the Canada's, Canada's Private Sponsorship Program for Refugees, which uh, has been uh, extremely successful and uh, is emulated by other countries like Australia. So, having said all that, Canada is not perfect and we still have a lot of work to do. But understanding that diversity and inclusion are the secret sauce for economic and social success. We seem to have more of it than most of the other liberal democracies on the planet. That is a great foundation on which to build. So I encourage the dialogue, I think that's extraordinarily important, to actually put together our collective intelligence, our experience, and let's get to work. Thank you.